Hello there and welcome to episode 81 of Right Where You're Sitting Now. The uh, chaos you just heard, um, unfortunately, was uh, a technical gremlin. So basically this is um, the second of, uh, well, <laughs> an ill-fated second live stream attempt of um, of, our, of our podcast on YouTube. And uh, last week we interviewed Christopher McIntosh and I'm, I'm sort of piecing that episode together into an audio. So that will come out uh, next week. But this one was with Tobias Cherton, and we were using some new software, and something, as you could hear, went horribly wrong. Uh, and uh, the, the ghost, the future ghost of Christopher McIntosh appeared to... Um, to uh, uh, he, I, We think he might still be trapped in our computer or, or something. Or, or, or something. Hyperborea. Or in Hyperborea itself. Hyperborea, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, apologies for not being able to see this, this episode. Um, obvious reasons um but yes uh, so coming up is is the actual audio version of the interview we did still record um the audio thank god um so yes with the vice but anyway joining me in the uh, the uh, the hot seat of of of, of doom is uh, mr mark satir I, I, I think after that it might be the supreme throne of chaos yeah oh yeah i yeah. think it i think it might be that yes yeah so uh how have you been and um very good excellent in fact Excellent. That's good to hear. So, what are we talking about this week? Well, another work by Tobias Churton. Uh, another superb work uh, to uh, complete the six volumes on life, the ideas, the work, the influence of Alistair Crowley. And uh, this this one, this uh, which is the last one, strange one to end on, really, in some ways, but very much part of the whole work is uh, Alistair Crowley in Paris. And if this was a musical, I would start uh, bursting into song at this point. But um, where we are, the image there, we are invited to uh, a place that uh, Churton, you know, loved, uh, the the uh, Paris of Romance and uh, the tete-a-tetes uh, the, the, the of uh, the chat blank with... Uh, Mom and uh, a figure called Oliver Hanto who looks suspiciously like Crowley and a spell will be woven by the green fairy as we uh, sit under the Paris uh, the Paris night in uh, the city of light and the city of love even so who knows what might happen next yep so here we come with uh, Tobias Chetton talking about his new book Alistair Crowley in Paris Tobias Churton, thanks so much for coming back on the show. How have you been since we we last uh, encountered you? Uh, a toboggan ride. A toboggan ride. <laughs> and how are you? Um, how are you? Kind of uh, dealing with all the the craziness in the world at the moment. It seems to be. I get up very early and I start work early. And if I have a nightmare, I start work even earlier. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, it, it feels like we're in a bit of a constant nightmare at the moment in you know very from various uh various areas um so you have a new book out alistair crowley in paris and yes, i so believe I got, I got it here. yeah there we go i believe um it's the final uh book that you're going to be doing for uh your sort of series on alistair crowley i think i think a six volume biography of crowley is about right mm. yeah and i you know i i think um Somebody wrote to me from Poland recently and somebody else from Czechoslovakia. You're amazed where the Crowley fans live. And uh, they said, well, we haven't done one on North Africa. I said, well, North Africa's in all of them in bits and pieces. I just think they were just desperate for another book from me, which is very flattering. Mm. But, I, I mean, otherwise I have to, you know, Alistair Crowley at sea or something. <laughs> yeah. Alistair Crowley's time on, on cross-Atlantic, you know, and all that, it, <laughs> I think I think we've covered 
if, if, if the essence of the man ain't there now, I, I, you know, it's, there's no, nothing to add, I don't think. It's a great body of work. It, it, you know, there all those volumes is great. You know, you are, I said it before, you're definitely the, the definitive, you know, uh, biographer on this particular subject. There's, you know, it's uh, the, living today. There's nobody can, can compare in that respect. True. <laughs> and that is true. That is true. That, that simply yeah. is a fact of, you know, it's like, you know, it's absolutely true. So, yeah, and it's a, yeah, it's a. So I'm, I'm 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 very um, grateful for that. So body of work as well. I can get a huge amount out of it. I was curious as to why you didn't do England last, and you did this one prior to that. Um, well, I thought I thought England was going to be the last one, oh, okay. and it was only it was a friend in Paris, a uh, 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 very much a, an enthusiast, clearly, who's a, who's a runs an, a huge uh, advertising consortium and um we were in touch over a tv drama project and it was his it was in some ways it was he said you know i wish you would do alistair crowley in france or alistair crowley in paris and it sort of dropped a thing in a seed and i thought he's bloody right actually there is crowley spent most of his adult life in or out of paris up until uh, 1930, 1930, 1929, he left uh, Paris the last time. But when you looked, I thought, my God, there's a huge amount here that we haven't gone into. And then I looked at the Confessions, which has this really awful, I think he, his worst section of the Confessions of Alice Crowley's auto-hagiography, as he called it, was the, the Paris section. And uh, he, he garbled it and was hiding a lot, as I found out more and more I went into it. And it's the only, I think it's the, of all the parts of the Confessions, it's the one where um, the 20 years hindsight actually distorted the truth of what was going on uh, in the 1902, 1903, 1904 period particularly. Um, and of course, he never, the Confessions was finished by 1923, so he never covered his years in Paris between 23 and 29, which are key, key, key areas. So... I suddenly realised, God, God, yes, that's a lacuna. I've got to get, I've got to get into that, and it was hugely rewarding. I think almost more than any of the others. Uh, I, I, I was amazed at what we we uncovered, mm. really. And what is your process for kind of gathering information? Sorry, that's not the that's not the royal we. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, I always think of my investigations as being collective in some way because of you know people obviously help. So, but really, I, okay. It, for me personally, it was it was it was a wonderful project. This one, I think, it's the last and the best, mm. which is a good way to go out on I've, that. I've been. In, I'm always interested in your process because you, you're very thorough. Um, I'm, how do you kind of go about gathering material for um, a Crowley book? I think. Uh, uh, oh, how do I get so good? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just I, I've, I've been researching things for so long. There's just a there's just a, a, a mode I bring to it. To answer that is a bit like saying, "How do I compose music?" And I I only know that after it's finished, I couldn't do it again the same way. Um, so I just follow I just follow my nose. I start to gather information. Um, I look at anything that's out already. Uh, then I go back to the sources that there are. I then check them i then follow certain lines now i mean this one was terrific because i was able to explore his relationship with a girl he calls nina olivier but in fact it was eugenie ozias who married um uh, leo stein uh, gertrude stein's brother leo stein was the man who introduced the world to matisse and picasso i mean he's the most important collector of art in the 20th century he, he is the man behind the the modernist movement and he married Crowley's girlfriend, who was a, working as a model and sometimes occasionally singer, uh, Nina Olivier. Now, she's a very important part of Crowley's life, but he kind of dropped the moment she got married. He was one of those people who thinks, you know, she's married, that's it, it's over. And he kind of dismissed her from his imagination about 1924. So she sort of pops up in the early period and innumerable poems. Um, but she was a big thing in Crowley's life. The other lady was the Honourable Eileen Gray, who is now being recognised in Ireland. I think she has an exhibition at the University of, uh, Museum of Art in Dublin. 
uh, she's now being recognised as one of the great uh, Irish upborn artists. And she and Crowley were engaged. Now, that's in no other book, the, the story of that relationship that they had, which is only frankly interrupted by his meeting uh, Gerald Kelly's sister, Rose. So th this, this romance of, of Crowley, uh, Crowley's letters to uh, what the, the chap who became his brother-in-law, Gerald Kelly, are, are all in the book. And nobody's gone before, uh, gone into them because they're written in a kind of Monty Python shorthand humorous style. And it takes a hell of a lot to break these down to what is actually going on. And that is also is hugely revealing because you see this whole artistic scene in Montparnasse, 1902, 1905. Uh, his friends are all trying to get into the Salon d'Automne, the, the, the great independent uh, exhibition uh, um, opportunity in Paris at the time. And he's very, very much involved with, with, with all these uh, expat artists and French artists and American artists. Now, there's no other source for this at all. And you would know, and Crowley being the kind of guy he was, he didn't trumpet that at all. Oh, well, of course, you know, he took it. It's all taken for granted. And no art historians have bothered to notice this because they think of Crowley as a totally separate thing to art history and cultural history. But in fact, what this book has been able to do, I think, is put Crowley into the cultural marrow of the early 20th century. I've always been interested, you've sort of touched on, a, uh, you touched on it a bit in the last interview, and this is your career in uh, film and television. I was wondering, does has that um, ever kind of crossed over into the kind of more esoteric um, side of things that you're well, interested in? Uh, yeah, the series I did for Channel 4, which was a, a hit series, Gnostics, Oh, okay. In 19, 1987, was a four, four one-hour, four times one-hour TV series shown at peak viewing on Saturday nights in 87, as repeated in 1990. And that was the story of the Gnostic Gospels, the Cathars, the Hermetic philosophy in the Renaissance, and then Carl Jung and various modern aspects of, of Gnosticism. It was a, an absolute, you know, it's, it's a, a gem. And I, John Randler, who commissioned it at Channel 4, did a whole thing this last year at the BFI where they're doing a sort of celebration of Channel 4. And he said, you know, it was one of the two series that made life great for him as what he could do, what you could do with an independent, a real independent uh, channel. So, but of course, the establishment of the time just didn't want to know about this uh, heretical spiritual thing because this, the, the Gnostic, tradition is so fundamentally spiritual it offends every materialist in the business and they they will publish any kind of rubbish or perversity but if it's if it's truly spiritual uh they 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 they're frightened of it yeah and that that's that fear of the esoteric is now extended to all religious material so there is no religious television anymore yeah I've seen the uh, I've seen the um, the the, the book. I've seen did you say or no, I've no, seen? no 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 I've seen no, 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 no. <laughs> I've seen the, <laughs> the I've seen the um the the book of the gnostics there's a, you, there's a there's a book isn't there to go with the thing. Yeah, I, not... did, I did I did the, the the channel 4 book which uh, was number 2 in the country and was a bestseller yeah, yeah. and uh, was a great launch I I think Austin Wells said I started at the top and I've been working my way down ever since um, it was a it was a it was a great hit, but again, it was one of those hits that the the the, the um, cultural establishment of, of London, particularly, just tried to look the other way that it wasn't happening. The way they they always hated Michael Bajant and the Blood and the Grail thing and all that stuff, you know. They and particularly Dan Brown, who's the, the most successful novelist, you know, umpteen years. Uh, they just don't like the fact that he's so successful in this country. It says it's something just, about it, the um, kind of the sort of appeal of this kind of subject, though, doesn't it? And it's kind of it sort of almost speaks to why Crowley maybe has sort of survived so long in the public consciousness. Yeah, it, it, why why are the Rolling Stones? Why were the Rolling Stones into Crowley? Why was why was John Lennon into Crowley? Um, uh, why was David Bowie into Crowley? Why why are these cultural uh, outsiders who have managed to through the rock and roll magic? have got inside to a degree. Why do they all look to Crowley or, or, try, or try to hide that, that but they're really looking anyway? Um, you know, even even 
uh, Ozzy Osbourne, you know, had a little dabble and he obviously didn't read too deeply into it or, or pronounce his name the, correctly. Read the wrong, <laughs> read, the, read the wrong thing. I don't know. But, uh, you know, and obviously there's Jimmy Page is the most famous advocate of, of Crowley's doctrine. Um, but he's had to be very careful uh, also because he knows that this is a subject which immediately invites the Daily Express uh, a type of journalistic mentality to start talking about um, cult perversities. Yeah, and, and you know, I always which is such a, it's such a bore now. Yeah, it I, is. I've, ri- I've, ri- I've written enough on the subject now to to make all of that nonsensical and childish. But no, no, they want to. They still. They would still want to play the old game with Crowley. It, it suits them, and you know he's, he's the whipping boy, and you know, he's a cult. You know, he unfortunately Crowley's cultural profile is based on um, Ersatz uh, uh, journalism. Mm. I almost see more as like he almost became more of a religious scholar in a way, didn't he? Or a, a kind he was of, always a religious yeah. scholar. Yeah, he was. He was at Cambridge. Uh, he did his three years. He. I, I think rather rather haughtily didn't sit his finals. But then again, people, aristocrats in those days very often didn't sit uh, their final exams. But his, his attitude was, you know, oh, I've done enough. And he, he just didn't, he wasn't up to it. So he didn't sit his finals, but he'd done his three years at Cambridge and he had excellent tutors who he got on extremely well with. And he was extremely erudite. And Trinity College Cambridge was a centre of um, psychical research, which was taken seriously in the university at that time, and he knew all the all the major figures of it, and his lifelong um, uh, correspondent Everard Fielding, who was an intelligence agent, uh, was the secretary of the British Psychical Research Society. So his attitude towards all this magic stuff was really, what's the scientific value of it? And he and his other interest was religious scholarship because he was. Uh, a religious scholar, he did very well in, 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 in theology, but he rejected the evangelicalism of his upbringing. Hmm. Do you think he would have... Pre- I, I always get the impression with Crowley that he, towards the end of his life, didn't really like the kind of tag occultist. Uh, he, no, he- well, he hated, he hated all that stuff. He, he was very, very, very... Um, suspicious of theosophy which had had this enormous enormous culture event he wasn't suspicious of blavatsky the founder she he liked her he thought she was a you know a messenger from the you know a, a great prophet in a way um but after her came annie besant and the whole thing split up into different groups i mean they're still going today theosophy but they 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 put all their they put all their credit in the indian bank the hindu and uh, Buddhist, um, but mostly Hindu, actually, uh, viewpoint. And um, he said he, his view was that this this was wouldn't get get anyone anyway. He had the, he had Crowley had a temperamental and a spiritual reaction to Buddhism, particularly, which he'd been very enthusiastic about. Uh, but something in him, I, I think, the whole Thelema religion is based on his internal response to the conclusions of, of Buddhist theology. So, which 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 de- uh, tends to deny the value of doing anything, you know, in this world because it's fundamentally uh, without a basis. Mm. I know. Where I think Crowley was uh, wanted some sort of reconciliation of the spiritual and the material. Mm. I've always wondered what because I I like to ask people this when we're talking about kind of. You know, um, Crowley related stuff, and in particular Thelema. Well, um, when Crowley says "Do what thou wilt" and um, it meant, you know talks about will, what is your interpretation of that? Because people seem to have different interpretations of what he means by you know your true will and this kind of thing. Yeah, well, it's a fascinating way of putting it, and it, it, it sort of discombobulates a lot of traditional teaching. But it, what, he was emphatic that it didn't mean "do as thou wilt." So it's not a license. It was never, as he understood it, and he regarded himself as the principal interpreter. So I would go to him uh, for his interpretation. It's his. It's his doctrine. You know, it's in his view. It was an inherited doctrine, and he made a particular synthesis of it. Uh, he think he thought it was always there. Um, I mean, he says about Christianity is that the world wasn't ready for a doctrine of freedom. So whatever the 
whoever Jesus was was saying in his view had simply been perverted uh, to certain degrees by certain kinds of mentality which uh, who were not up to it. Now, what he was talking about was a spiritual liberty. This idea of the true will is is the suggestion that in the uh, in our deepest core of our being is is the divine, and that this uh, is linked to uh, everything that exists and every pers- every individual awakened person has a particular orbit like a like a planet a particular orbit to follow and it's your duty thou hast no right but to do thy will your duty is to find what your orbit is do it and mind your own business i think mind your own business is another way of putting thelema in the nutshell mind your own business as my father used to say People without any business of their own are forever minding somebody else's. And I see that in the world today, in triplicate, duplicate, you name it, quintuplicate. There is no end of people minding other people's business. They know what's wrong with everybody else. But as Jesus put it beautifully, you you look at the uh, moat in your brother's eye and miss the bean in your own. The great thing about Crowley's synthesis is it's a, it's a practical response to uh, this infringement of another person's freedom. Your right is to do what you're here to do. You're not here to interfere with anybody else's. You, you know, you may be able to help people who are looking. That's a, that's a different thing. But it's your job to do your thing. Now, says, so ah, oh, but what if true wills conflict? Well, Crowley would say true wills do not conflict. Well, they may have a little scrap about it or a big argument, but out of it will come a respect. As brothers fight ye, as the... Uh, the book of the law has it. You know, there are, there are going to be frictions uh, and, and all that in this, this thing. The issue is freedom. This is what Crowley cared about. And you have to have the freedom to find God. And you, this is something that is, must be for the, for the true star, the person who's going to really radiate light in the world. Uh, this is something you've got to concentrate on. If you're concentrating on what somebody else is doing, uh, you 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 know it, it is Jesus called it hypocrisy. You know, the, 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 this, um, judging the other for the very thing you're doing yourself. Your business is to find God, i.e., the ultimate truth of yourself. Call it what you will, and uh, once you've done that, you 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 get on with it. Now, luckily, as you rightly said earlier, we have a, a if you like a balancing doctrine love is the law well isn't that the christian ideal love is the law but he makes the point love under will meaning he didn't want this thing to be some sort of sentimental love cult oh i'm so in love i'll do anything <laughs> no. uh you know i think that it, it, it's a different kind of love it's it's you've got to be able to that your love has got to become rather universal and and not and rather impersonal it's, yeah, um, sort of tempered what, with what, will as well, isn't it? It's sort of tempered with will, a sense of purpose and self-discipline and focus, and then and yeah. yeah, it's sort of. And he knew, and he knew perfectly well that, of course, that's too much for a lot of people. This wasn't a one-size-fits-all concept, uh, but for those who would master the world, that's the way to go. And I, I quite honestly, as he knew, and, and you can see from reading history. That's the way it's always been. The people who've made a difference are those who've done this. Yeah, and I think I think yeah. people, look, there's there's plenty of people who are sort of following the this sort of formula, this philosophy, and, and but they don't, you know, they don't have a name for it, and they don't need a name for it, and and also as well, there's also um, I find from my own experience, people who are familiar with or. Uh, or actually douse themselves familiar with that sort of school of thought. It's like it's very much like the true way of going. It's uh, it's the the idea of the, the true will. And the, and it's that. And I it's, like I like the true will because I think um, you take the will out of it. I mean, Lord's Prayer again: Thy will be done. You know, it's 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 uh, as on earth as it is in heaven. Our our job is to is to have a a cosmic view of what we're here for so that we do on earth what, what is written in heaven, as it were. You have the idea of the holy guardian angel, of course, which is that aspect of the self which is uh, other than this world. But it's not the self as we normally think, i.e. my feelings about me or something like that. 
there, there is this notion, uh, and it comes from Neoplatonism and, and has all sorts of historic antecedents, that a person has a governing genius. And if you make contact with a genius, you will start to perform. I mean, it's very obvious in the life of so many artists at a certain point, they contact the genius. It's, the genius isn't them. People aren't geniuses. They make contact with the genius. Genius is, is the spiritual uh, root of their identity, to use English language to try and express it. So the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, which is just a lovely arcane 18th century expression of what you could express in psychology as get to know your unconscious. Yeah. All right. And, and well, Crowley's system is, 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 is one of these things that's, that's, that's wonderfully simple, but um, very elusive at the same time to try and apply, given our cultural, what we, what we, the, our cultural inheritance. He was after a synthesis which synthesized the best of all religion, philosophy, and science. That's what he was heading for. The aim, was it he put on the Equinoxes magazine series, The Aim of Religion, The Method of Science. So he was trying to produce a scientific form of becoming divine or reaching your higher potential uh, and, and so on. Now, the applications of this seem to me to be infinite. I, I regard Crowley as a prophet of, of, of true freedom. And that's why as we be, become more and more enslaved by fears generated by the media and the people's fears themselves, he becomes to me more and more clear about why it's important. It was difficult to justify Crowley's importance in the past because there was a general conceit that we, 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 were, we were fully civilized as we were. And the more we're going on and we're having to deal with complete cretins like Putin and so forth, um, who have no love in them, or what they love is their own totally uh, personal vision of things, or he's attached his pseudopod to one country or one identity, Russia, Russian, etc., and totally blind to the, the cosmic reality in which that entity exists. Uh, the more we're faced with these, these megalo people, uh, vast egotism, but tiny ideas, uh, but you would never convince them of this, as you know, uh, we, the, the Crowleyan position, which is that the, the, every individual has this profound potential to link with the total cosmos and acquire cosmic consciousness, becomes so much more important. And it, it, it will, in my opinion, in the future, revolutionize all of the religious uh, systems, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, whatever. Uh, and eventually, the, 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 a new seed will be laid. That was his idea. He always worked on the basis that, you know, this Thelema idea would take maybe a thousand years or whatever, however long. He did think that World War II would cure people <laughs> of, of a lot of the nonsense. He did think this was the last great war and the, the, thelem the Thelemic principle of personal liberty would be established. And we've all lived through that. If you live through the 60s, you saw this, you know, enormous, the child, the Horus, struggling to get free. You know, can I have long hair? Can I sleep with my girlfriend? Wouldn't it be nice, you know, if we had this extra freedom? Now, obviously, the problem with all this social freedoms is uh, with freedom, responsibility. And there was an irresponsibility which came with it, which was unhelpful. But some, in the early stages, it, it's always a reaction. And it was a one-sided reaction, which led to the opposition, the hyper-conservative, we don't want any of this stuff, we don't want long hair, we don't want sex, we don't want our children, blah, blah, we don't want rock and roll, it's all satanic. You got that reaction, and we're still living in, in that tension. And, and now the reaction is even bigger because what was a Western European uh, vitality fantasy, to use uh, Christopher Booker's terms, is now unfortunately, partially unfortunately through the internet, we now get the comments on Western mores from, as I say, the former Soviet Union and Iran and all these places where personal liberty has been extinguished for years. 
you know, countless years. So they're, they're struggling with it. And uh, they think they can step back to the 12th century and the, uh, the, the theology of Baghdad after the Abbasids uh, fell. And, uh, you know, Putin thinks he can go back to the time of Peter the Great. Well, they can't, you know. And um, so we, 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 we muddle on. And uh, the, the Crowleyan um, message, I think, is as relevant now as, as ever. Yeah, I think that that uh, that phrase is 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 beautifully put. Simple and elusive. That's uh, that. I think that sums up Crowley's sort of the Crowley kind of um, body of work, canon. You know, wonderfully well. And in yeah, that, it, it, it yeah. offends certain kinds of minds. Uh, it offended mine. You know, uh, I had to. Uh, it's 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 always uh, enlightenment can be painful. <laughs> yeah, he, ma- he makes you work for it, which is, he, you've got to put in the work and in there. And I, I, I totally recognise some of the things that you know in the heat of, in the heat from talking very personally in the heat of sort of magic and uh, you know you have these glimpses, these very brief glimpses of uh, you know a sense of self which which is not your everyday. My everyday self who goes to the laundrette and pays council tax. That's that's just the, you know that's just a part. You have these little flashes of of a much wider uh, horizon. Mine start. I was I suppose I was lucky. I don't know or unlucky. It depends how you look at it. Uh, I mean, I experienced. Um, I believe the phrase in Japanese Zen is Satori when I was five, and it changed my entire consciousness from that time on. And uh, he got, obviously then in years later, I went to school and started meeting these very oppressive kinds of teachers you get in every system uh, who led me to a sort of state of confusion. And I was semi-confused when I went to Oxford and started studying theology. And then we met more of some of these bad teachers and it's been a, it's been a constant struggle. To, to find the light, but, uh, you know, you stick with it, you'll, you'll get there. Well, yeah, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it feels almost like, I, I don't know if you read the recent, I think it was a recent census data that showed the UK, it, for the first time ever, under 50% of the population identified as Christian. Um, hmm. That's That feels like a... Um, like uh, something Crowley would approve of, <laughs> at the very least. But uh, in some ways, no, in some no. ways, not. I think, mm. yeah, in some ways, in some ways, not. No, I, well, it would do, no. It'd be more interesting. What, what are they identifying as? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, yeah, excellent point. Yeah, um, you know, reacting. I first of all, I don't believe any any of these uh, these um, statistics. Uh, they haven't asked me, for example. <laughs> you know, or anyone I know. So, you know, I, I, it, it, you know, these are newspaper headlines. I think people are uh, fluid, and it depends entirely who they've met at a particular time in their life and what's go, going through it. As for we, we all know that church attendance has dropped to a level which is very, very difficult for the church to cope with. You know, it's no good having a church system with large spaces open and empty pews. Uh, there was a great effort in the 70s to fill them by guitars and evangelical uh, sort of revivalist kind of thing. Uh, it hasn't really worked, although I'm sure some. I'm sure if there was a good enough Billy Graham who came and probably Phil Wembley with a lot of lost souls who are looking for God, you know, I would, would think that's possible. We may be on the verge, actually. I, I have a sort of feeling that England's kind of, you know, like dry grass waiting for a spark. And something amazing could could yet happen because I think the younger generation have been completely uh, abandoned from the religious point of view. They they don't know very much about it. I mean, they obviously have access through their endless mobile um, visceral connection, uh, but how much good stuff they can get and, and so on, I, I I don't know. It's very difficult. Um, there's no public information that's respectable in in the media on the religious subject because the Producers and that are totally afraid of the subject. Um, they're terrified of it. And they don't like it anyway. And the BBC, when I worked there, was the philosophy was logical positivism, and uh, the whole thing was well, we'll provide for as it's our duty to provide 
broadcasting for the nation will we'll have songs of praise you know keep the old people happy in the old people's hands some nice hymns you know and a nice story how somebody helped somebody else and all the rest of it and that's their tip in the hat in their favor of religion whereas to any seriously spiritual person uh, spirituality is absolute has endless ramifications and particularly in science and it is not a, a department of Sunday tea time you know how, how we conceive of the universe and our place in it is absolutely fundamental science is always asking questions answers the occasional one but is utterly subject to the information at hand as is our ordinary human reason. But we have to get by when we don't have answers and we don't have the science and we don't know what's going on. And at that point, we, we have to have some kind of overarching wisdom to get us through. And people will reach for that at certain times lives. When, when deeply loved people die, they, they want help. You know, it's no good, journalism isn't gonna help them. People who have lost loved ones, uh, or they suddenly find they're very ill, etc. The journalists can't help. The state can't help. You know, where do they go? If they've got no conception of the overall sense of what life's about, they will, they, if they don't have that, they will get depressed, lost, lonely, and they'll end up having to go to the doctor and they'll be put on antidepressants. And that's our solution at the moment, antidepressants. Instead of positive knowledge of the spirit, this positive knowledge of the spirit is what uh, we should be engaged in generating. That's what my entire life's work is, has been about. And I'm, I'm, I'm one, of, one of many people who feel and, and have acted upon this impulse. You know, and uh, it's, it's, it's becoming rarer and rarer because our world is being taken over by conglomerates and uh, conceited politicians and all the rest of the innocent people who, as Jesus said, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my personal case, I, I, I had the uh, good fortune, I was brought up as a good old-fashioned atheist, but I've on I've made the point of reading, I've read the entire uh, Bible, uh, King James Version, if you please, and uh, the... The best uh, written, oh, yeah. And I've read the whole thing, which is more than most... Christians and, and funny enough you know it's in you know is that you can't deny its influence if you go into a gallery half of the pictures there and half of the and also history they relate to the narratives in 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 that book but uh, mm. also in the same way you know without uh, actually it's probably if Cro Alice Crowley never existed without his influence I probably would never have read it and that, mm. and, that, Isn't and, that interesting? and that's yeah. that's an intriguing that's in a totally intriguing sort of uh, you know, kind of. Um, oh, there's an art. There's a wonderful art of to that. And um, but uh, I'm, you know, I, I encourage everybody to. I think you know, everybody should do that. Everyone should read it and come to their own understanding. Or, you know, and, and you, you can see how it's been written and why and and so on. It's uh, it's, it's it's fascinating. I think we 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 live in this information age, and we just need more information. There is information out there about so many things that people are fascinated by. It only requires. Uh, our, our means of edu information, namely the, the TV channels, pr primarily, to uh, report this in in a in a sympathetic and intelligent manner, and people would have far more to go on. Um, that's what we were doing with Channel Four. We did that with the Gnostics. There was another series that John Randler uh, commissioned called Jesus: The Evidence, which uh, I w it should have been called Jesus: Some of the Evidence, but. Mm -hmm. I, it, it had a huge effect. I mean, the Queen wrote uh, and complained about it, and uh, it was it was uh, incredibly got people thinking about things. It's like there's a lot of data in the world, but not a lot of guidance on that data. That's the way I kind of see it. Um, you know, the internet's full of information, but it's it feels chaotic in a in a sense that it feels like there there's some some sort of guidance missing that used well, to exist with information and now yeah well, you, you know. yeah it's, it's the overall philosophy and 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 a religious context in which to understand these things now i'm not saying in the past it, it was any far from perfect but there was an attempt to involve people with a bigger worldview is what i'm saying whereas now if you just leave people alone 
uh, without any guidance, well, they, they wallow in ignorance. That's a fact. I mean, you don't get educated if nobody wants to educate you. Yeah. you know? I mean, information, yeah. is, information is one thing, and understanding and experience is a, a, a whole dimension, a whole another dimension, yeah. isn't it? And it should be a growing, changing thing. I think it's right that, you know, I thought this when I was 16, but when I was 27, it was different, and now I'm, you know, 47, and I, I'm prepared to say that things that I thought were terribly important when I was 22 are less important than other things because I wasn't aware of them. I just didn't see that other point of view. And as you get older, you should be acquiring more and more points of view. And hence, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Don't, don't think you've got the truth and start sticking it to other people. You know, this is tremendously, uh, it's, it's, the road to, it's the road to bloody ruin. It really is. Mm. I, one of the things that's always fascinated me, and you cover it quite well in the book, is um, it, Crowley's relationship with Mathers. Um, and it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's um, it's an evolving relationship, to put it. It's a, it's, it's a key. It's I a think key. it's a devolving relationship. Yeah, yeah true. I mean, it's a key one. I mean, um, Mathers did establish a, a golden dawn temple. Golden he was a dawn. genius. Yeah, genius, think, yeah. Mathers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Absolute he, genius. Yeah. Nobody had ever done anything like. Well, actually, somebody had. There had been the the golden Rosenkreuz movement in the 1750s, 1770s, to the 1770s in Germany, which also tried to set up a kind of uh, mail, mail order, uh, mail order enlightenment system. Uh, so there were, there were um, uh, precedents, but I think the Bather system was, was terribly good. And, and unlike the Golden Horse, of course, it was open to men and women. You didn't have to be a Freemason. Yeah. And and it was the Temple of Hathor uh, that he uh, Mathis set up, totally appropriate for the uh, City of Love, number seven, which in the obviously has astrological, cataclysmic relations to Venus. So that all flows very sort of neatly, doesn't it? I think he was. I think he was uh, really uh, extraordinary. But I think he owed a great deal to his wife uh, Mina Mathers. Um, you know, uh, it was. Um, Henry, Henri Bergson's sister. Um, she was a remarkable artist uh, from the Slade School of Art in London. I think she had a very powerful influence on him. And they became priest and priestess of Isis, and they gave lectures in Montmartre about Egyptian religion. And there's an interview, I think it's in the book, that was done about 1900 when they were uh, demonstrating the Isiac rite, the rite of Isis in Paris. Um, with the uh, journalist, the very interesting journalist backing them. And uh, it sounds so modern what they were trying to do and, and really it's very inspiring. But something seems to have gone awry in Mather's mind after the Golden Dawn split up, which was largely his own doing. I mean, he provoked the London First Order into a, a rebellion, which needn't have happened. Uh, but he had become terribly autocratic. Crowley recognized at the time that, you know, this autocracy was the a proper principle of authority and he supported it. And he came later to realize that actually uh, uh, Mathers was the author of his own downfall. It's, 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 a, it's a sad story. And uh, how, um, how important do you think his relationship was with Crowley for Crowley? You know, it seems like... Crowley seems to throughout his life have kind of attached himself to certain, um, I guess, uh, teachers uh, um, over the years. And Mathers does seem to be one of those sort of formative teachers in Crowley's life, doesn't he? Um, early on, in his well, he ba yeah, he based his whole magical career on on the structure of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And when he produced his own order, the uh, AA. Uh, sometimes called the Astrum Argentium, Silver Star, uh, it's, it's a simplification of the Golden Dawn system without the social element. He, he believed that the social aspects of the Golden Dawn was what really wrecked it, was that too many people interfering with other people's ideas and um, that it become a kind of talking shop. And uh, so in the AA, you only learnt from your immediate superior uh, who told you everything that they knew and you did the test, but there was no social aspect. So it was like joining a club. And that, that was quite an austere departure. 
I mean, even Freemasonry is a, is a collective enterprise. There's, a, there's people come together and they enjoy fellowship. But that's one of the reasons he backed the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, was to provide a kind of social wing for those who are seriously interested in attainment. Um, Mathers was terribly important to Crowley, yeah. And I think even even after they split definitively and after, after Mathers' death in 1918, I think Crowley always had good words to say about him. Yeah, I mean, out of the fallout from the, the Golden Dawn experience, and the Golden Dawn was always in Crowley's DNA, right to the like, to the end. Um, he, he, that's what, uh, that's where the the concept, the no idea, the notion emerged of of um, members wearing hoods, so that you wouldn't that the personal bit would be removed as much as it possibly could do. I mean, that's interesting. In the and he he does that himself, doesn't he? When he goes, he goes to the um, the, the to try to collect on, on Mather's behalf. He goes off to try to confront Golden Dawn members, and he wears a, a hood himself and, and a kilt and various other well, things. You no, know, he wore he wore a sort of um, like you'd wear in a fancy dress ball kind of. Yeah. Face covering, or like a don, I mean, don, a domino, they would call it. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Anyway, it yeah, it was that. Well, they they had hoods in the Golden Dawn when they were doing ceremonies. Anyway, um, but no, I don't think I don't know about the hoods in the AA. They, it was normally if you were doing an invocation or an evocation uh, ceremony, it was it it would have been normal to cover your face, generally speaking, but didn't have to. And certainly when Crowley practiced magic. For the rest of his life, very often he, he was perfectly happy to do it without a magic circle, without impedimenta, and maybe just some symbolic elements, maybe a candle or whatever. He said, once you've cleansed your inside, you, you don't have need of all this symbolic stuff, which is meant because that's the purpose of it. So you, you didn't have to do his, his later magic is, is almost free from obvious ritual. Out of interest, like uh, for people that don't know the story, um, how I mean, at one point, Crody was um, almost acting like a, I guess, a lawyer or a, a kind of a, a benefit, a, a, a patron almost of um, of uh, Mathers, wasn't he? He was. Um, so how did yeah, he- well, Matt, yeah, Mathers was desperate for money, and he'd been sponging off uh, members of the order uh, for quite a long time um, because he had no independent income, and. Uh, and Crowley stupidly said, you know, I will put my entire fortune behind you, which is sort of very brave. And it was, I think he was trying to get the secret chiefs on his side by saying, I'm bloody serious about this magic. And um, uh, Crowley wasn't very impressed by the other members of the order, of course. That was the other thing. And he, he thought that we've got here a kind of Saturn V rocket that's being clung to by, the, by, by a bunch of people in a club, you know, and if we can clear them off and, Get them to they just should join theosophy or something um they want something wet and silly i if we're going to get this thing going we need to clear clear that up but as it turned out uh um he had to, through meeting alan bennett in burma in 1903 uh, sorry 19, in 1901 particularly but they they met later again bennett told him some things about Mathers. We don't quite know exactly what he said, but he lost, began to lose his faith. Now, Bennett had been Mathers' uh, adopted son and knew, um, knew Mathers very well and called himself Alan McGregor, uh, as, as Mathers called himself, Samuel McGregor Mathers, <clears throat> trying to link himself up with the clan. Uh, which had a magical potential in Scottish mythology, the MacGregors. And Bennett and Mathers have been very close, but it's quite clear that something had happened that made Bennett seriously question his integrity. And Crowley was inclined to believe it, practically every, anything Bennett told him. So he was suspicious. But being Crowley, he, he, you know, he, he'd come back. He was a very forgiving fellow. You know, he wasn't this sort of, you know, make great statements, and I'll never speak to you again. <laughs> he wasn't like that. He, he just harbored some suspicion that Mathers wasn't all that Mathers was claiming to be, i.e. the sole contact with the secret chiefs, the spiritual governors of planet Earth. He believed there were secret governors of planet Earth. That, in fact, was a staple 
of Rosicrucianism from the 18th century on in Germany, France, and uh, the enthusiasts in, in England. The, the, the universe is, has grades of governance and Crowley wanted to come to their attention and he thought Mathers was the means to do it. And in a sense it was because he got his training in the Golden Dawn. But once he'd, got, once he'd entered the inner order and, and got to a kind of position of equality with Mathers, uh, Mathers then became very difficult. He also had stolen some of Crowley's stuff and sold it for money while Crowley was off on his two-year tour of mystic quest around the world. And he wasn't too pleased about that. Crowley was, you know, very as an upper middle class person. And if you left your goods with somebody, uh, you expected to get them back when you return. Uh, but of course, Mathers was uh, had, a, had a slightly crooked side, as far as one can tell, where money where money was concerned. Yeah, and it was actually in Paris, you know, in in Hanover. Four temple. Yeah, there. Living, he, living from hand to mouth, yeah, yeah. you know, and and. and practically living through his wife yeah and that's where and that's also where Crowley sort of entered the you know the Rosicrucian aspect of the Golden Dawn in in that on that particular in that particular location as well so yeah Crowley was very immature about all that and he, as he recognized in his later life he was you know he was still very young uh, and very he was young for his age in some ways I mean he had he had a very mature uh, consciousness in terms of his intellect but uh, emotionally in, in many ways he was he was he was very young and he was inclined to be over enthusiastic. As he said to Gerald Kelly, was it not Gerald Kelly, somebody else, I forget, years later in the 30s, he said, I was a, a little too, too, I was myself too keen to wear epaulets. Oh, well, whatever happened to him, it, it's, it sort of worked because it, it's had its effect, <laughs> didn't it? I mean, it, it came with him and uh, he took those, that, those elements with him. So, yeah. I, I mean, it'd be an amazing thing if someday. And it won't be in my lifetime, I'm sure. Uh, but if someday, you know, when they study modern theology at Oxford, gosh, that would be incredible from my experience. But if it ever happened, that, that Crowley was included as part of the, the spiritual history of, of <clears throat> well, I'd say it would now say the world. I think he, I think he has a role, and I suspect it all depends on the caliber of people who pick up on it. Um, and, you know, there are people who like Crowley because they think he's, you know, oh, he's a rebel, rebellious. I, I agree with all that. So, oh, yeah. <clears throat> the, the, the rock, uh, without being, I don't mean being unpleasant to the rock and roll, but there's a kind of, there's a kind of slightly mindless libertarianism that goes with um, rock, uh, you know, certain aspects of rock music. Um, and people are looking for a sort of fashionable rebellion. And Crowley will probably be taken on by them. Some of those people grow out of it and find something better. Um, but again, it's, as I say, it all depends on what people are introduced to. What, you know, do they get the right book at the right time of their life? I find if you're very sincere and you, you ask for guidance from a higher power, that it is a higher power, you will be. You will find a way, and the, the book turns up at the right time, and the person is there, who, who, if you want, will help. I do find. I do do think there is a providence in the world, a providio, the, the eyes that see before we see, and we're not entirely alone unless we want to be, and even that's a, del a delusion. Interesting. So one thing that really struck me in this in the book again it's close to the the start of the book is the sort of effect that Crowdy had on women we spoke about his sort of friendships with women but he seemed to have this uh, kind of um charisma that appealed to a certain type of woman and i can't remember the name of the woman now at the book it's close to the beginning of the book where he almost kind of cons her into pain for alan bennett's um <laughs> yeah yes and she's got a fantastic laura graham laura graham she was the she was uh Laura Hornyblow. Hornyblow, that's um, it. Yeah, I, I, it's the most was, appropriate name. Great, great name. Yes, yes, absolutely. Like one of those, like one of those confessions. Well, she was just. She, yeah. she was. It was quite a familiar story that middle class women whose husbands went out to India, who didn't go with their husbands for any number of reasons, depending on the nature of the um, the posting. 
a lot of women did go out to India, but a lot of them stayed in London for any number of reasons. And the husbands would go out as a lieutenant colonel in the Indian Army, and they'd be stuck in London, uh, getting very frustrated sexually. And then here's some young, handsome fellow with a bit of money, and uh, they get charmed, you know, and um, have an affair. And she was she was a woman who affected a deep interest in his spiritual beliefs, but I think he was, she was most interested in what he had in his trousers. That, that would be my reading anyway, maybe very unfair. But uh, he, was quite, he, he, he was quite bowled over by her. They obviously had a very good time um, amongst themselves. And yes, there was this whole thing about who's going to pay for Alan Bennett's trip uh, to, to benefit his health by going to Ceylon, as it was called then, Sri Lanka today. And um, she was saying, how can I help you? Because they'd actually sort of split up and she was desperate to get back in with it. And he, 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 he well, you know, he was he, that attitude. Well, okay, if you, she said, and she said, oh, I, I want to make my contribution to the spiritual future of mankind. I said, oh, are you sure? Yes, 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 absolutely. Anything to meet you at the Sussex Hotel at three o'clock tomorrow. And he said, all right, well, if, if you could come up with a hundred pounds, um, uh, that, or whatever it was, uh, uh, then you will be saving not only a, a great human life, Alan Bennett's, but probably contributing to the future of humanity. Because, of course, Alan Bennett led the first Buddhist Sangha to England. So he it was prophetic. He was right. He saw Bennett as a, a world changer. And hundred pounds was a significant amount of money then. And the- I think it was. A, I think it was a ring or something. Oh. Uh, I think she said, "Oh, have the ring." Oh. And and then she got upset because the relationship didn't go the way. Who knows what went on between the two of them? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, there was a guy called Gardner, who was a member of the Golden Dawn, who'd said to her, "Don't go near that Crowley. He's a reprobate. He's bad news, and he's part of the devil." And um, she made the mistake of telling him that she'd, she'd given him some money. He then went to the police. I mean, Crowley could, could have just simply have walked away with the money, and he, he didn't. And I mean, that's that. People... No, it wasn't money for him yeah, at yeah, all. He could yeah. have given. He could have given um, Bennett the money, but I think at the time he was doing the Abramelin ritual, and he, and there was something I can't remember what it was. There was some. It was a spiritual test, basically. Um, he, that he interpreted as meaning that he couldn't buy his way, he couldn't buy his way to to approval or something. I, I forget. It was very clearly had a very complex mind. If he'd have wanted to give Bennett the money, he would have given him the money, and it was as simple as that. But I think I think it was sort of slight uh, his humour that she said she was prepared to do anything to get back uh, into his arms, and he said, "All right." do this and she volunteered to do it and mm. she only backtracked when Gardner got to her and said and 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 the and she suddenly realized that you know she wasn't going to be the center of Crowley's love life yeah and Alan Bennett is, is a very important uh, relationship in Crowley's life as well and one of the very few people he esteemed he all yeah, you know, one has of about a, three yeah, yeah when Oscar, he esteemed. Was Oscar Eckenstein, uh, Alan Bennett and uh, J.W.N. Sullivan who was a yeah writer on cosmic science yeah. for the times and i reckon also in the, in the early days in paris when they were young you know gerald kelly as well i mean the, no, it's no, a, no he would never looked up to gerald kelly but they but they had a, obviously a very close relationship and they were like young men about town is i mean it's told in it, about what my impression no, yeah yeah, uh, yeah my, my sort of impression is that it, with gerald kelly i mean he became you know a way not part of the demi monde at all he was he became totally respectable and uh, was knighted and so he he was very became very removed from that but you know there the were young men around you know about town in the fullest sense of the word and and ex, and and enjoyed all the 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 things that paris could offer including in women and and uh, they had that sort of shared they had that shared relationship they seemed very pally i think but yeah they, they, were, they, extremely, strange. they were extremely uh, uh friendly yeah uh and with no sexual element interestingly no um but they were they were they were they were sort of for a time. The trouble is is um, Kelly had invited Crowley to somehow share the existence, and 
Crowley came to Paris from Cairo um, at the end of 1902 after the the attempt on K2, and he was much he was older than and Kelly and considerably more experienced in every way. But he believed in Kelly's desire to be a painter and he wanted to encourage him. And he didn't stay in Kelly's flat. He he he, he, he took a flat opposite in the same street as Kelly and just sort of hung around. Now, my guess is that what happened was that Kelly, dawn, it dawned on Kelly that Crowley was a big draw for the ladies. And uh, all these female artists who met him, I think, started to, you know, get quite excited about this ha handsome athletic chap who turned up, who, who had an extraordinary brain. And my, my feeling was that the jealousy started then um, over time, which of course manifested by, you know, post-war when, when he was in, oh, I can't remember, what, there was a, in the book there's a whole sequence where Kelly writes about the Crowley's autobiography and says, this is rubbish, that's exaggeration, no, I never said that, that, that all of this stuff. I think it was when, um, around the time, I think John Simons was doing his biography, The Great Beast. But he, he was in denial that he'd really been friendly with Crowley in some ways. Although in later years, there are two people I knew who, who met Kelly. He had good, a lot of good things to say about Crowley, so you can't quite work out. Yeah, that comes across very strong in the book. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? And um, It is a puzzle, but I think it has to do with the family. Yeah. Um, Kelly, Kelly was very, very much... Uh, the respectable type, um, despite his protestations. Um, but I think he was respectable. He was the son of a vicar of Camberwell, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was. I think the big thing that he couldn't deal with was that Crowley's sister, uh, sorry, Gerald's sister, uh, was prepared to marry him almost overnight. Yeah, and it was such a shock for the family. I think that adds uh, uh, lots of complications in the relationship, and also as yeah. well, Rose Kelly is uh, you know became an alcoholic, and I think with everything that you know that entails, and I think he, he never refers to that part. Of, he must have been aware. He must have been aware of that, and he never refers to that when he's talking about uh, that. The kind of um, his view. His view is very judgmental that Crowley carried on having affairs uh, when he was married to his sister. Um, but I can't believe for a minute that, that, that Rose ever imagined that Crowley wouldn't carry on having affairs because his entire philosophy, which he must have said to her in, in, in umpteen times, uh, was that, uh, that sex was simply something between two people and had no uh, nece necessarily uh, spiritually compelling element if it was two people who just wanted to have sex. Whereas he regarded her as as an inspiring character. I mean, he was fascinated by her, uh, as he said at one point. She's an empty-headed woman of society, but he trusted her intuition powerfully, and she did learn to or had the ability to be clairvoyant. And he used to, uh, you know, put her in situations where she would, would read the cards or whatever it was she was reading about people she knew. There's much more about Rose that we don't know. No, sadly, nobody ever interviewed her before she, she died. I think it was 1931, if I remember right. She's a fascinating character, Rose. Now, one would love to have met her. One has a feeling she was one hell of a character. Oh, absolutely. And she had that sort of, uh, the fact that she married Crowley, initially he's in, you know their intention was so she could escape the 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 pressure to marry yeah exactly and uh, so uh, she must have it, that in itself says a lot about her at that time i think you know oh she was she was she was uh she was into the you know how would you say she was a party girl hmm. and she was a widow she was a uh, 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 husband scarish had uh, died of alcoholism in south africa this is, must have been a very common story in the old days of the British Empire. A lot of uh, soldiers out in far-flung outposts of the world, bored out of their minds, turn to alcohol. Um, marriage starts to break up, affairs and all that. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's the way the middle classes of England 
In fact, the middle classes of any bloody country anywhere in the world operate. Look at the film Emmanuel, which is about the French middle class diplomats in Thailand. You know, what do you do with these long, hot days? Do you have a sauna or do you have an affair or do you, you know, do you indulge your sexual taste? That is just everywhere all the time. Crowley didn't like it, but he, he couldn't, you almost couldn't avoid that kind of lifestyle. Mm. He was only, Crowley was only really happy when he was on a mountain or walking in a jungle or something like this. He could only stand so much of human um, bourgeois, as he called it, society. And he did mellow a bit in the in the thirties, uh, perforce, because he had no, no choice. He, he didn't have the means anymore to take himself off to the Caracarans and the Himalaya or whatever, or the Mexican mountains and so forth. He la he lacked the he lacked the ability to get away, so he had to conform. I think it must have been hell for him in the thirties and forties to be surrounded by British middle class mentality. And returning to the Bohemians of the. Uh, Chuck Blank in Paris, uh, um, one of the other characters, but important in Crowley's story, in every sense, but is, is Somerset Maugham and the and uh, their kind of uh, friendship there, and that, what that brought about. I mean, uh, it's the first time that Crowley's ever and a Crowley-inspired character is represented. You know, as the Oliver Haddo in the in the magician in the magician. Um, yeah, Not yeah. Well. Somerset Maugham kind of spends the rest of his life denying, you know, that this book was ever anything but a, you know, youthful peccadillo, not really serious. Um, yes, it is sort of a model on Crowley. But if, I think for him was an acute embarrassment because Crowley had realised what a hodgepodge it was of borrowed materials, as he, as he said to uh, Maugham himself. You know, you, you, you painted this picture, very flattering, he said, in some ways. That's Crowley's irony. Um, he, 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 you know, he just, he just thought, well, you obviously sat there, listened to what I had to say, and you've, you've written this book. It's not, um, it's not the last but, time, of course, because you had other, um, you know, in the um, M. R. James is uh, casting the ruins. There's a Crowley esque figure, isn't it, Doctor Carswell? And uh, it's, yeah, a, I, don't, it's I, the I don't think that's, I don't think that's Crowley. Um, although, if you, you know, the movie is amazing, isn't it, mm. Night of the Demon? Oh yeah. Uh, there is in Niall McGuinness's, is it Niall McGuinness plays the part of Carswell? I can't remember. It is, that. isn't it? Yeah, and his mother and all that. I think that I think in the movie there's a there's there's a kind of memory of Crowley, uh, savagely distorted. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah. I, that's what I sort of mean, and and uh, but he is. I the, don't know, I, but I don't think M. L. James knew Crowley, but he might have known yeah. him through Cambridge contacts. Yeah, yeah. He didn't know him, but um, uh, from my understanding, it, it's uh, it, it, it's sort of based on. I mean, they, in M. M. R. James is where he sort of uh, sn snooty from a scholarly point of view. There's lots of class stuff and there's there's lots of disparaging comments about um um the the oliver the uh, dr carswell character in it but he, he, weirdly uh, the, I, I've, in the narrative uh, um the, of the story the uh, dr carswell figure writes in hand in beautiful hand this manuscript about alchemy and and uh, he tries to get it published and of course they, they also you know, these scholars say oh it's all it's all you know fantasy it's all you know sheer fantasy and the rest of it what's he, what's intriguing about that i've actually i've i've seen the, uh, the original text of uh, uh, casting the rooms where mr james that uh, wrote him is himself and it's all written beautifully in hand it's it's that's really bizarre it's really it's like kind of weird thing there and in that in that funny enough in that little moment in the book in the short short story sorry where he where they describe it all being written in hand uh, this this book on alchemy there's a sort of gr almost grudging sort of um praise or you know respect there's a sort of integrity to that, and there's a hint of something more than just uh, superstition. Yeah, that's fascinating, isn't it? What year was, was Casting the Runes written? Oh, uh, uh, 19, 1911, I think. Well, yeah, maybe, because Crowley kept up his contacts in uh, in Cambridge, and uh, knew, knew, he knew Kenneth Ward, uh, who was a professor of psychology, and, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, well, M.R. James... He's a not. He's so into apocryphal and gnostic works. Exactly, yeah. he, I can't see how he could have avoided Crowley's reputation. 
and people who knew him. So there may be something there. Yeah, and I, think- I like the way you say that, you know, there's grudging respect for, because Crowley was a scholar, as, as so many of his works make absolutely clear. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. You know, he was not an autodidact. He, 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 he could be an autodidact, meaning he, mm. he studied according to his own pattern and his own desires. Now, he was partly an autodidact, but he actually was academically well up there. And it had and was trained was trained uh, in and how to deal with materials, and he had a great sense of history. Um, and many of the things he was interested in, uh, are, you know, are only recently becoming of general interest. Absolutely, and then also, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, Mom's book was made into a film as well, and I'm always like, I don't, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what if Crowley ever saw it or. Yeah, he did. He did, and he 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 launched a lawsuit. It was at the Gaumont Theatre in Paris, and he launched a lawsuit against MGM. And Mm -hmm. he tried. That was after he he wanted compensation because uh, of the background of the film. But he also recommended his friends go to see it. Yeah, I've got a cop. I've got a copy of the Magician. Yes, I've uh, seen I, it myself. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen it myself. It's it's begging. Yeah. yeah, it's begging to be released on Blu-ray in a much better condition, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it's got Michael Powell in it, hasn't it? I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, it's there's my, my a young Michael Powell of Powell and Pressburger um, playing a part in the film. Um, with, you know, working for Rex Ingram on the, on the south coast when it was made in in the Riviera in 1926. Mm. It's an extraordinary story. Crowley obviously wanted to do more films and stuff like that. He loved all that sort of thing. I wonder what he would have thought of uh, Chemical Wedding that came out a few years ago. I, I think he might have trodden in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the best. I've always said it's Carry the, on Crowley. It's yeah. always, it's, I always said it's the best carry on film they ever made. <laughs> Uh, I'll leave. Th- I'll leave that judgment to, poster- to posterity. Is there, <laughs> is there any chance that the the Gnostics uh, program you did is there any chance of it coming out on DVD or or is that going to come out in any form? Well, I I, I contacted I think its own um, Border TV that made it for Channel Four had the rights, but Border TV doesn't exist anymore, and it was all bought up, including all the outtakes. By the way, there was enough for another series in the outtakes. I, I can. The, the best stuff, as usual, was left on the cutting room floor. My God, that was an incredible project. And we did some amazing things. Um, but it's all owned by Fremantle. And I contacted them about 10 years ago and said, what's happening? They wanted me to pay 20,000 quid or something to buy the lot. And I don't have it. So I tried to get some people in America to cough up. And this bunch of rich kids who all wanted to help the world uh, couldn't cough up. <laughs> And um, so I believe it's still languishing in some vault somewhere. Mm. It's a tragedy because it, it, it would be, if it was shown again, even in its original state, it was beautifully, beautifully photographed, mm. a lovely film. Harold Goodall did the music, which was a pastiche of, of Eric Satie. And, uh, it was a, and who was the narrator, famous actor in Jewel in the Crown? I can't remember. He played the villain in Jewel in the Crown. You remember that? Yeah, very good. Uh, he's a famous actor, and he's still around doing stuff. Anyway, it, it, it had all the bona fides, and it was – if it was shown, let's say, today, it, we could relaunch the book. It'd be, it, no, you wouldn't know it was 40 years difference. It's actually better quality than any documentary I've seen in years. I'm the sorry, quality I, I, is, I, is first rate. I'd be surprised if at some point it doesn't see the light of day, and, and, and because there is, because it exists first of all, and also there is a. There oh, is it a, does exist, yeah. and, and I think that somebody's put a, a kind of pirate low, what do they call it, um, res low res thing. I think is on YouTube, or oh. it was for a while. I think there. Are, I think you, if you, I think you can see parts of it if you try go through the internet and troll. I, I I've seen bits of it. I find it slightly embarrassing. I've got I've got a version myself, nice, very nice, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a bloody it's a bloody great thing. We not I mean we interviewed Muhammad Ali Al Saman, the man who found the Gnostic Gospels. No one had ever done that. No one's done it since. Yeah. We've got him on film. The man who actually cannibalized the guy uh, with the whole story around how he found the jar at the Jabal Al Tarif. We interviewed him in in uh, near Nag Hammadi, near his village of Hamradum. We saw the the oven, filmed it where his mother had burnt a load of the books. 
we filmed the original Gnostic Gospels in the Cairo Museum, and we went around the world with that. That was filmed in Florence, America, Egypt, you name it. It was a fabulous series. Yeah, I've seen really part. Fabulous. I've seen part of that uh, manuscript in the uh, Coptic, the Coptic Museum in Egypt, in Cairo. That's it. That's the one. Mm. Well, they got they got uh, practically all of them there. Mm. But Pahol Abib, I must be dead now, I suppose. Pahol yeah. Abib used to be the guy in charge of that. So, obviously, you're you're finished with Crowley for now, at least. Uh, oh, never finished. <laughs> but in terms of in terms of books, yeah, I would say I would say absorb what I've done. Mm. And if you come to me and say there's something that's vital that you've missed up, I'll listen. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and so, obviously, are, are you going to continue to write books on on the esoteric, or are you uh, are you going to take a break now, or what, what, what's the um... take a break? Take a break. <laughs> I Life's see. too short to take a break. Mm. Eventually, we reach a point where we have to take a break. Mm. Yeah, true. <laughs> uh, who wants that? Yeah. No, I, I've got a book, another book coming out in the autumn, which is the first ever total history of the origins of alchemy, and it's called The First Alchemists. Very important work, uh, more, much more um, related to scholarship and uh, the work of other scholars. I wanted to, an authoritative book on the origins of alchemy and Scotch, the incredible nonsense that's talked about alchemy. And that I've grown up with has confused me over the years, whether it's Carl Jung's version of alchemy or people who still want to believe that John Dee had some alchemical gold in his pocket or whatever it is. Uh, so I thought, well, let's look at every bit of the evidence of early alchemy and present it precisely. So that's out in the fall. That's called The First Alchemist. And the book I'm working on at the moment, um, nearly done, is is the amazing book of Enoch, which is the most powerful work ever to appear in the world. It's the origin of Jesus's uh, operation, as I call it, of the ministry. Jesus' ministry. It's Jesus' operation. Uh, it's based on the book of Enoch. Uh, pre-existing book which e is still part of the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Church canon and is in the Bible it disappeared from the Western world in by the seventh century and um, was brought back by James Bruce when he went in search of the Nile brought back a copy in 1773 but it wasn't published in English until uh, 1821 uh, and it this made very little impact until H. R. Charles's version in 1912, but the biggest thing is is Qumran. When they, uh, the scrolls of Qumran, they discovered at least seven fragmentary copies of the Book of Enoch in the Qumran library. Uh, whoever was responsible for that, it's the most incredible story. Without the Book of Enoch, there is no Gnosticism. There is no uh, itinerary for Jesus's operation, and vast amounts of the Renaissance occult movement would never have happened. It is the key text for esoteric spirituality. And uh, it's I think it's the most exciting material I've ever had to deal with. And that's saying something. It really, having, it really having is. Having given a lot of time to, to Alistair. It really is. Uh, funny enough, uh, the book on Enoch is one of the books of which I don't have um, in my library, and I've been so I've had my eye out for that. So uh, now I I know I just need to wait, and uh, I'm going to start. Next year. I'm going to start sometime with next, sometime I'm, next year. I'm going to I'm going to um, defer the pleasure and uh, and uh, wait for for yours, and that will be my proper first you know read of it. So uh, yeah. brilliant. I I I think it, when the when the penny drops, whenever that is. Uh, there will be a sort of, uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I, would like it, I would like it to have the kind of, you know, splash that the Gnostics had, really, uh, where people start to think differently about things, but in a hyper-positive way. I, 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 I would be remiss to not ask you this. Obviously, after it's been quite a journey you've been on with Alistair Crowley over, you know, over the years and six books. What's your kind of takeaway from the whole thing? You know, what what have you learned? Um, what's your kind of, I guess, uh, you know, what what what's your your takeaway? What have you what have you personally learned about Crowley? And um, you know, uh, yeah. 
Well, I think it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, it sounds, it's all in the books. What I've, uh, what, <laughs> I haven't taken, I don't think I've taken anything away. I'm just part of the, I'm, I'm, I'm playing my part in that same old, very, very long story of which he was a part. You know, you have this tradition of, uh, of, of, uh, engagement with God, the mystical, the magical, the, all of this stuff, the transcendental philosophy, blah, blah. Uh, I, I, I don't ever feel I've taken anything away. I, I hope I've been able to give something to it. That's really what I've been trying to do is to give something to the reputation of Crowley by presenting him uh, honestly, warts and all. And uh, if you want to say, well, if somebody says, what do you think of Alice Agra? I say it's a very fascinating and can be, if you get get a grip on it, an inspiring individual, if, if that's something that appeals to you. Um, do I think he's the, the prophet for all the future? Well, he's a prophet. I mean, most of the people who contact this kind of material end up as prophets. There's so many, Pico della Miranda, Ludovico Lazzarelli, um, whoever was behind the Rosicrucians, um, uh, Johann Valentin André. Um, this kind of spiritual gnosis, uh, knowledge, generates prophets, meaning people who overspill and want to tell the tale and speak truth. Um, so, yes, of course, he's the prophet of Thelema. He's the prophet of, uh, of, of, a, of a message of freedom uh, in the modern world. And the great thing about it is you're free to take it or not. He's, he's not coming at you with a scimitar, re repent or die, or, um, you know, I think he's the freest, uh, the freest religious teacher there's ever been. And as somebody said to him, oh, to hell with your law. Uh, I forget one of his friends said that. And he said, look, my law is your law. <laughs> Are you saying to hell with your own law? Do what that works with the whole law. You, you find your law. So, no, I think, he's, I think he's the most important, personally think he's the most important uh, religious figure of, of the modern world. I think he is, he encapsulates it. His, everything in his reputation, I can imagine people fuming, Chertnia, you know, you're uncritical, you're one-sided, you're, you know, you're just a follower. I'm not a follower at all. I just, I, I recognize, I don't follow this thing. I don't follow it. I've, I have my own uh, way of seeing things. Um, but he's a figure that has challenged me and challenged others, will challenge, should, should challenge, I think, and it's good to be challenged. And I think the conceits of uh, narrow-minded era need to be challenged profoundly. Uh, we are currently being surrounded by barbaric mentalities, intolerant, unfeeling, unloving, and unenlightened. Thank you so much for giving us uh, some, yeah. so much of your time again. It's always a pleasure. Um, uh, if, Thank people, you. if people want to find you online, where's the best place? They'll find information. They won't find me. <laughs> <laughs> I, try, I try to keep away from this line. Um, no, seriously, yeah, I've got a website, TobiasCherton.com. That's my name. That's the, that's, that's the thing. Look up Tobias Churton and it all, it all, all well, not all. But uh, there'll be plenty there to tuck into. Yes, some and, will be uh, revealed. <laughs> this, the new book I'm doing is my 27th commission book. So uh, some of you got some catching up to do. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to having you on again soon, hopefully. Thank you, Mr. Churton. Uh, you are, you're a force of nature. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. No, I'll think about that one. <laughs> It's been a delight to speak to you and thank you for asking me very much. Much appreciated. And we are back. Um, thankfully, we got through that interview without the uh, the 
the the hyperborean the demon we could do we could do one on a hyperborea and then we could just play that on a continuous loop yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just some kind of uh insane it's chaos a, yeah like the multiverse it's like the sitting now multiverse yeah exactly. multiverse of madness the ultra terrestrials came for us oh, i think they did actually. Yeah, yeah yeah so uh how was the interview for you oh uh, you know uh, 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 one of the I think my greatest disadvantage is that I have such a high esteem of um, Mr. Churton, so it doesn't make for a good podcast at all. Just hearing me gush like a <laughs> like a kind of sort of you know teenage schoolgirl or something, but uh, you know it's uh, it's always um, it's a force of nature. And uh, I tell you what, I'm getting a huge amount of uh, stuff from his book. It's it's been really valuable. So. Mm. Uh, you know, and he's left us with a, a corpus of these six volumes now, and um, it, it really needed to be written. And it, uh, and he brings uh, an analysis which uh, which few people can match. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's been a fair few biographies of Crowley over the years, and yeah. I find that they either tend to be um, negative, like obviously, like the Simmons. Yeah, um, yeah. who is that? I mean, uh, uh, Simons. 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 Yeah. He. I mean, that, the the first one. I mean, it's it sort of set the tone. Also, where it reflects, it was written in nineteen fifty, early fifty, nineteen fifty one, I think. So it's a very conservative, very different world from the one we live in, mm. and and you know, there's been a whole so the spectrum. I mean, I don't actually know how many there are. Some are much better than others, actually. Yeah, uh, but there's also so it seems like on one side you've got the kind of bombastic negative kind of book, and then on the other side you have the kind of aggrandizing kind of um, apologist almost book. Yeah, it goes yeah. the other extreme, and the pendulum seems to swing the other way. But uh, I think uh, Chesney, you know, presents Crowley as a human being in the fullest sense of the word, and and because we are human beings in the fullest sense of the word, that's the one we can relate to or make most sense to, or more, is more relative to us and our and our situation. I think it's you know it's it's the best Crowley could have hoped for, really, isn't it? In, I think know. it is. Yeah, mm. I, I do. Um, I, I do, and it, it is a you know it, it's it's um, it's not a light read. You, you've got to you've got to work at these things, and mm. um, you know, it's there that 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 corpus, that body of work is there, and I think its influence will be long, long, long reaching, and hopefully it'll be one of these things that kind of because you know to, um, Tobias was saying. Oh, maybe after the interview, I don't remember, but he was saying that, you know, a lot of the mainstream media is ignoring his work yeah. and uh, yeah, hopefully it's, it's something that will kind of, um, you know, evolve through time with reprints and, you know, uh, it will, as, as often uh, these things do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these things will endure and those mm. who, who get it will get it. It will, you know, that's as it should be. And the, uh, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, we are back now. Uh, we had a bit of a break over January and the end of December. Um, but it's mainly because I was trying to get this, all, this as you can see, this ill-fated live stream stuff happening. Um, but yeah, we are back onto our weekly schedule again now. And uh, um, we'll be back next week with Christopher McIntosh talking about Occult Russia. You can actually see, if you're, if you're impatient and you uh, don't want to uh, wait, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash sitting now. Uh, and you can see the interview, um, but without Mark and I's commentary at the beginning and end, like we like we do. Um, obviously, come and subscribe to us. Uh, there's lots of video content coming now. It's all planned, and you know it's taken us a while to get there, but it's all there. And eventually, we'll get the live streams, uh, uh, you know, working properly. And you know, um, that will be a good thing. Uh, you can find us online uh, everywhere now, including Facebook at Sitting Now. So I, I've unified it all. So any any social media that you want to follow us on at Sitting Now, and we will see you with Christopher McIntosh next week. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.